Good morning. Well, welcome everyone. We have John Butler here with us today on Let's Talk Real Estate with Kim Meeker. Uh, a lot of people know him as the bald guy with the red tie. So, John, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Good morning and thank you. I'm really excited to uh, see what comes out of today. It should be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, as I was sharing with you, um, and I want to share with our viewers that this is our first, I would relaunch of Let's Talk Real Estate with Kim Meeker. We actually put this out in 2008, 2009 before COVID and we're bringing it back on today. So I just want to just let you know how humbled and grateful I am for you to be our first guest to relaunch the show. Well, thank you. It's exciting. It's uh, I'm very proud of you. I know as we were just uh, chatting before the show here is that, you know, sometimes we get these big visions and ideas and then, um, you know, in American culture, we want it to happen right now. It, you know, yeah. it should be instant gratification and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, sometimes ideas have to germinate and kind of stew and, and then eventually you get that end product. And uh, so I know you've been working on this for uh, a while now. And uh, so here we are. So enjoy this mountaintop experience. I'm very proud of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, John, one of the reasons too, I really wanted you to also be one of our first guests is I just love your journey and how you got to be in our successful real estate agent, but most importantly, how you got here. And, you know, you've shared certain things with me and, and over the years when we worked together with our previous broker and, you know, you brought me into your world, which was, I feel like it's a huge gift to me, but also very personal for you as well and sharing your book. Uh, with me about your your journey and how it all began. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you for sharing that with me. You picked me up literally when I fell on my face after the first, first chapter. I didn't know if I was going to get through it. Um, I was in tears when I sent you that text message that morning. Um, and when you said, you know what, it gets better. I thought, okay, I'm going for it. So thank you. But would you like to kind of share with us, you know, share, share with us where that all started and if you're good with that. Oh, of course. Yeah. I'm literally an open book, you know, being a yeah. writer and whatnot. So, um, so for those who don't know, I I've had a very colorful life. It's been very adventurous and quite a journey. And, uh, so my, my story kind of starts in the armpit of California known as Bakersfield and Bakersfield is as the last part of that name, uh, <laughs> describes is mostly a field. And so I grew up racing motocross and dirt bikes. Cause you know, when you're a, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid. And you could just go ride a dirt bike for miles. And, you know, I come from the era where as long as you're home by the street lights, by the time yeah. street lights came on, you know, so what a great way to grow up. Uh, and then I was very focused on, um, uh, I wanted to be a professional motocross racer and, uh, was well on that journey to do that. And, uh, everything was going well. Uh, and then when I was about 15 years old, I found out my mom had cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And so, as a young man um, who doesn't know how to deal with emotions or problems, you know, my, my solution was just to go hide in a field on my dirt bike and kind of uh, push all of that negativity away. Um, and unfortunately, as, as she went through her journey for about a year and a half, this was back in uh, 97, 98, 1998. And so uh, at the end of my junior year, uh, she unfortunately uh, passed on to the other side there. And the morning of June 5th, I walked in with my stepdad and my sister and uh, we turned the corner and, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen someone that has left their body, but there's a very interesting stare that they have if their eyes are open and hers was. And so she was just staring right into my soul. And it was a, a stare that I'll never forget. And it really that was one of those there's 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 moments in your life where it becomes like a a chapter you know an ending of a book and then a beginning of another yeah. and, and and so uh at that moment you know i started this whole new journey where i went from going you know from being a 3.8 grade point average student uh motocross racer you know i was going to go to college and be a business major and all this kind of stuff and all of a sudden all that was thrown out the window and it's like okay well how do you survive without your mom because uh, my mom was the foundation of our household and so as i went through that journey of being 16 17 18 19 20 years old um 
I didn't necessarily have the healthy support systems in place. And so I decided to make decisions that, uh, you know, was, was trying to self-medicate um, and numb that pain. And, uh, and, and so basically I went on to a, a psychedelic uh, adventure from 18, 19, 20 years old. And so I always say that I dropped out of college, but I got my uh, master's degree in psychology from LSD University. Yeah. And, uh, but the reason I did that, um, looking back now, you know, retrospect's always 2020. Um, but I, what I was doing is I was self-medicating and, uh, but really it was, I, I was trying to discover who I was mm -hmm. after her loss. Um, cause she was so much a part of my identity and literally 50% of who I am, right? Like you're 50% of your parents. Yeah. And so, um, it was very rough. Uh, I, I was homeless, not on the streets, but definitely surfing couches for about two years. I think in two years I moved 24 times. And, um, but the whole time I was, I was, uh, journaling and I was writing, uh, I started writing probably when I was about 14 years old. And so, um, at some so so I was journaling real quick. So journaling was your, was your safe zone. That's like where you escaped to be who. And you know what actually inspired it? Remember Doogie Howser? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Show? And remember how he'd always type out like how his day went? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's where I originally got the idea from. Was really? Doogie. Okay. And so I remember when I was 14 and I got my first computer, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to write. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but it turns out that I was actually pretty good at writing um, it, because when I was about 19 years old, I, I read my uh, dad uh, a little snippet of what was going on in the hell that was my life at that point. He's like, wow, that sounds really good. That's, that could be a book. I was like, wow, a book, huh? And then so that kind of planted that seed. And at that time, you know, Oprah was huge yeah. and uh, and Tom Cruise was jumping on her couch because he was in love with Katie Holmes at the time. And I was like, I want to jump on Oprah's couch. I want to sell a million books. And at that time, you know, I'm, 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 I'm homeless. I'm, uh, uh, you know, unemployable uh, besides selling dickweed shirts, which is I'm sure we'll get into that. And uh, and so I figured if I could write a book, then I would be rich and I'd be on Oprah and, and life would be good. You know, and that's my meal ticket. And um, <laughs> so I went down. I left Bakersfield to go down to Ortega Highway to live with my aunt. And I told myself I was just going to live there because uh, my current situation at the time was falling apart. I said, I'm just going to live there for two weeks. I'm going to write a book in two weeks. And then uh, by the end of the summer, I'll be on Oprah and then I'll be rich and then life will be good. And uh, life doesn't always work out that way. Right. And so what we were just talking about, your journey of, of making this podcast is sometimes you get the idea and then sometimes there's the uh, the growth gap, the mm -hmm. time that it actually takes to blossom and and be fulfilled. And so, you know, I started writing my book at 19 and I think I published it when I was about 26. So it's about a seven year journey. And so um, I remember when I first got my my first box of books from the publisher, uh, you know, it's quite a mountaintop experience, much like you're having today. So. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Well, and I just, you know, I think that what everyone needs to, to also see here is that your, even though you went through the the huge pain of losing your mom, you know, and being the the man of the house, you know, you had your your stepdad, right? You know, through marriage, right, and your sister. But you know, some similarities that I felt to you when reading that book that I didn't know until I read the book to myself was I have step siblings as well, right? I mean, I was raised with them being known as my brothers, right. but I'm really my own individual person. Yep. And it, they're, they're eight and 10 years older than me. So I did kind of grow up as a single child, but it was just me and my mom. So, yeah. you know, when you, that she was your person, yeah, right. She was your whole. And so going through and losing that and going, grief is a very challenging thing. Right. And so uh, for us to go through as humans, but you, so even though you weren't aware of it at the time, but subconsciously you were able to shift that into something that gave you all these dreams. Right. Like if it, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's definitely not something that you wanted to ever have happen, losing your mom, but had that have not happened, you would not have had possibly those dreams of being someone even bigger and better. Right. Like, of course, motocross, it can be huge, you know, as an athlete, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, motocross, it, you're an athlete, right? Oh, yeah, and, then, very much so. 
and, and it's very um, challenging and tasking and, and competitive and all the above. But but because of that situation and being at your aunt's and your your dad telling you, you know, that's that could be a great book. Like just all those wheels were turning in your head, regardless if you were homeless and on people's couches, something was was the beginning to something really big was happening. Something was being birth birth there. Right. A hundred percent. And, um, you know, so going through that, that psychedelic, uh, phase of my life of 18, 19, you know, 20 years old. Um, and, and I know a lot of people don't, they have a lot of misunderstandings about psychedelics. They think that, uh, it's the hippie, <laughs> the hippie colorful, uh, phase of things, but there was something very needed during that time where I, you know, I was basically trying to figure out who I was and, uh, those psychedelics kind of really, um, uh, whether you, once you jump, once you buy the ticket and take the ride, uh, you're on for the ride. You can't get off the roller coaster. And so the thoughts and, um, and the rearranging of reality and just, uh, all of those things of discovering who I was, uh, times a thousand, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. your thought process on on one of those experiences just, uh, is, is on super speed, light speed. And so it was really fascinating to kind of, uh, see the inner workings of my mind and my soul and, um, and really have a different perspective of reality and, and life. And, uh, so that's why I think I have such a different approach to this business, to life, to, to writing, to artistry, all this kind of things. Um, I don't encourage people to go <laughs> jumping into it. It's certainly not something that you want to play with, uh, willy nilly. But for me at that time, that was a very, um, important, uh, phase yeah. and the lessons that I learned from it. Um, you know, you can't gain anything until you lose everything. And so I lost everything during that, that phase of my life. Um, but as I lost all the leaves of the tree, you know, new branches, new twigs and new leaves were, were coming. And so I started to realize the seasons and patterns of life. Mm -hmm. And especially having documented my life through the journals and stuff like that, I could see the patterns and the, the ups and downs, the, the, the valleys and the mountaintops, and then be able to articulate that and put that into book form and share that with people that are going through tough times. Because when you're going through a tough time, it's so easy to be like, oh my gosh, no one's ever gone through a tough time before ever before. I'm the only person to experience pain. Um, but when you can read another book that someone's gone through a very similar journey as you, uh, it, it brings comfort and hope and inspiration and encouragement. And, um, and what's beautiful about writing, um, and this is a, a theory that I have, is that writing is eternal. And that's why it's very interesting that the Bible was such a very um, powerful thing. You know, in the beginning of uh, uh, the book of John, it talks about how, you know, the word was God and God was God was the word. And I'm totally butchering that. But essentially what that means is, you know, as a writer, when I sit down and I write something in the present moment, someone in the future is reading what I wrote in that present moment. And so when they're in the future and they're reading that, they're they're now reading something that I wrote in the past. But it's still relevant because it's this eternal, you know, the infinity sign. Right. The infinity, uh huh. And so that's why all art, whether it's music or it's um, uh, writing or painting and things like that, you know, something that was done in the present moment, and creativity took, you know, the unseen and made it seen, which that was God's one hundred and one business, right? Yeah. Um, there's something very et- eternal and beautiful about that. So if anybody's thinking about writing or or developing their art or whatnot, I would highly encourage you to do so because it's not only just great for yourself, but what that can do for other people is um, very inspiring. So you really, and we talked about this earlier too, is, you know, you're always coming from a place of contribution, John. Like even when you went through that period, you know, um, you know, being, you know, testing out the drugs and trying to find out who you were, right, with your friends and stuff. And a lot of people you know, have done that, but, but where it took you and the path that it took you to where you utilize ideas that came in, into your mindset in order to thrive, right. And just stay alive. So that also birthed some other entrepreneurial, um, gifts that you didn't know that you had as well, your mindset and stuff. So share a little bit about where that took you on your journey of entrepreneurship. 
Well. As, as far as the entrepreneurship, I, I would definitely um, attribute a lot of that to DNA. Um, my father is, a, is an incredible um, marketing genius and really my whole um, Butler side of the family. They're very um, marketing oriented. Um, to, to put it in good context here, you know, a lot of families will get together for their family get togethers and they'll talk about sports and, you know, their sports families and stuff like that. Um, what we would do as a family is you know, somebody would say something funny because we're all verbally witty and uh, <laughs> our family's awesome. But uh, <laughs> uh, but we would we, someone would throw out an idea like, oh, wouldn't this be a cool product? And then somebody else would chime in and say, oh, yeah, and you can market it this way and you can create this promotion and this campaign. Like that's just naturally how we talk. Uh, nice. and, and, and so from a very young age, um, marketing was just in my DNA. And so I, I come from a family where my mom and my my biological father uh they split two weeks after i was born and so it was kind of that you know passing little john off between the parents and stuff like that and i adore my father he's he's just a, a wonderful human being and i just always wanted to be next to him be with him and all that kind of stuff so when it was time to spend time with dad he would take me to the office and i would sit in the corner of the office and play with toys or whatever but i would listen to him negotiate i'd listen to him talk about marketing campaigns with his art directors and stuff um, my dad is one of the original pioneers of putting televisions in suburbans uh, back in the 80s and so wow. he was one of the ones that came up with that concept. Um, he was also, there's so many things that he did during the automotive industry of the, the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and stuff like that. And then when the internet revolution came together, um, he was a pioneer of that as well. Um, so that's kind of my uh, biological stock, if you will. And so as a young man, as a, as a kid, really, I would listen to him do all these things. And so when I was uh, in preschool, um, I would get my GI Joes because I realized all the toys at school sucked. And then so I would tell the kids, hey, I'm going to bring my GI Joes, bring me a dollar, give me the dollar. And then you could play with my toys during recess. But then I need you to give me the toy back. So I was renting out my toys, not selling them. I was renting them because I wanted the toy back, but I wanted to keep the money. Yeah. So that was like four years old. And so that wow. got busted when my mom, uh, I think we're at McDonald's. And she was short a few bucks for the meal or whatever. And I pull out a big old wad of cash as, you know, a four-year-old. And she's like, she thought I stole it. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, so that was kind of my original business. I uh, was renting out my G.I. Joe's for a dollar a day on the playground. And then um, I was always the top seller for uh, all the, the fun campaigns at school that, that happens, you know, cookies and all that kind of stuff. I would paint rocks and then sell them to the neighbors. And I'd say, well, you could use it as a tire stop or you could put in your garden and stuff like that. Now I'm not an artist uh, with paint. It was literally just, you know, finger paint on a oh, wall. Yes, oh, I was told because I was a cute, charming kid that they would, they would give it to me, right? And then um, I think I was about 10 or 11 and I, I started a pooper scooper business. Uh, and then when I was 14 and I was in the motocross racing thing, um, my mom and stepdad, they realized, well, hey, if we're going to be at the races every weekend, we might as well try to turn this into a tax write off a of business expense. And so we started a, a trackside motorcycle accessories business called Factory Edge Accessories, where we would change tires, sell goggles, you know, little accessories that, you know, racers, they forget on the way to the track. And so they need to pick something up. And so that was one of my first businesses. And then so I, I created all the advertising and marketing campaigns. And so I did that as a 14, 15 year old. And then after my mom passed away, um, I was with one of my racing buddies named Brady and he had a clothing company that um, they started or they did a batch of shirts basically. And it was called Dickweed. And so Dickweed was named after their uh, wiener dog named Sir Reuben Dickweed, the 21st. And, uh, and so after my mom passed away, I had a businessman that came into my life and he said, um, Hey, I got $20,000 to invest. I'm looking for, uh, you know, a, a creative project. You know, do you got any ideas? And then so I talked to Brady. And he's like, why don't you do dickweed? And so we started selling dickweed shirts. Um, but the businessman, he was kind of a father. And so he's like, I don't like the name of that. So he didn't want anything to do with it. And so my stepdad, I pitched the idea to him. And he's like, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. It might be some good experience for you. So my stepdad gave me 650 bucks to start uh, the dickweed t-shirt business as I was going into my senior year of high school. And um, immediately it just blew up. Uh, this is in Bakersfield, uh, California. And in your senior year, you can join the work experience program. And, you know, with the thought of you're going to go work at McDonald's or Taco Bell, <laughs> and, then, and they sign your little, uh, your sheet says, okay, they showed up, uh, give them an A plus or whatever. 
Well, I t went to the teacher and I said, hey, I own my own business. Um, can I be in the work experience program? And they're like, well, we've never had that happen, but I guess so. And so I was able to give myself a grade, which of course was always an A plus. Yeah. Um, and then, so the dickweed shirts, that's what kind of got me through that, that rough phase I was talking about earlier, that 18, 19, 20 year old stage, because I would get enough shirts and I could sell them. And then I would live off of that money. So I didn't have to get a, a real job per se. Um, and then when I was about 21, I started a, a Christian motocross ministry. Um, this is after I gave my life to Christ. And uh, I, I just really had a burning passion to take motocross, which was my my passion growing up, and then see if I can use that as, as a form of ministry. And so I became the promoter of the freestyle motocross team, Christian motocross uh, called CMX. And uh, I would be the guy on the microphone at these events, you know, oh, look at a heel clicker, can, can, knack, knack, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I was the promoter because I'm all, just a natural marker and promoter and things like that. Um, so that, that's just a couple of businesses. I don't know if you want me to keep going, but that was part of it. Yeah, but that was where, you know, you birthed all that and you got the experience and you got the quick success, right? And so within that, you know, of course, success leaves clues, right? Right. And so with the clues that it left for you, you just kept building on top, on top, on top until you got that break. So let's fast forward, you know, when did you... When did you decide to get into real estate? When did you actually decide to come on over to, you know, the real estate side? I know you moved down to Temecula. So kind of take us fast forward into that area so we can talk a little bit more about your real estate business and how those experiences you've utilized in your business to today with your marketing, the bald guy, where that was birthed from and such. Absolutely. Um so I'll, I'll end off on the previous, what we just chatted on, because um, I, I, I'm a big believer in design and symbolism and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not sure a lot of people know this. So I'll point this out and it's probably going to blow your mind. So you see the logo behind me here? Yeah. See, that's a t-shirt. Yeah. See, that's a helmet. Yeah. And see the red tie? Uh-huh. So when you talk about stacking and building all these different businesses and stuff like that, so the t-shirt business, that, that's kind of a hidden symbolism in there, and then the helmet, and then the red tie. And so, because um, that's where I learned a lot of my promotions was from the clothing company and whatnot. So I thought, I don't know if a lot of people uh, even know about that. So I thought I'd point that out to you. I did not know about that. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Um, so in regards to getting into real estate, at that point, I had uh, left Bakersfield. I... I uh, arrived in Temecula on January 2nd, 2004, and I had literally spent my last $5 on beer in uh, Boston because I went to Boston for about six weeks because I, I was at one of those transition points of life yeah. where I wasn't sure. Like all my everything kind of closed down in Bakersfield. All the leaves have fallen off the tree again. You know, I had a, a, a long term relationship that ended. Uh, the ministry got closed down. All these things started closing down. And um and so I want to point that out is that, you know, sometimes we go through life and there are things that fall away mm -hmm. and we try to struggle and hold on to it. And, and we go, oh, my God, ah, you know, you go through that panic stage. But that's just the natural progression of the seasonal um, phases of your life. Yeah. And so for those that are listening to this and, and maybe things are closing down, you lost a job, uh, you know, maybe someone passed away, you know, relationships fell apart or whatever. Um, that's OK. Uh, you, you're going to get through it. And really, it's just the, the natural progression of life. Um, so I arrived here uh, completely broke. All I had was my laptop, my Bible and my clothes. I moved in with my uh, grandparents in Temecula. And then so I her big thing is she wanted me to go to college. And she said, hey, why don't you come down to Temecula, live with us and go to college? Because, you know, if you get your college degree, life magically is going to be perfect. It's going to change. Yeah. yeah right. Um and so, I, you know, I was homeless again. So I was like, OK, fine, I'll, I'll come live with you. And then uh, I ended up getting, a, you know, my only job experience at that point was being a waiter. So I, I uh, went to all the restaurants and um, I was looking for a job and um, and they all got shut down. Nobody wanted to hire me. And then I went to Macaroni Grill. And I walked in to get an application and I noticed that there's all these people waiting to be interviewed. And then, you know, just feeling defeated. I was like, oh, I'm not going to get the job, you know, screw yeah. it. So I get in my little Astro van and, uh, and then a voice as clear as day said, go back. I was like, oh, 
okay, you know. And at that point, you know, I, I had no go back to the macaroni grill to interview. Go back to yeah. So you know, that voice of God, you know, uh, taps you on the shoulder and says, "Hey, dummy, <laughs> go back." I was like, okay. So I, I go back, and then um, uh, serendipity stepped in and uh, and ended up getting the job. And then a few weeks later, it was Valentine's night. And I see this cute little strawberry blonde, kind of the pigtails, uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous woman uh, standing at the end of the counter. And it was Valentine's night. And I said, so what are you and your boyfriend doing for Valentine's night? And she's like, I don't have a boyfriend. I'm like, all right, cool. So I mean, a little background research. And yeah. then uh, a few days later, she was waiting for a ride outside. And I said, uh, so what time am I picking you up for the movies tonight? And uh, she said, you tell me. I was like, yes. And then, you know, a year later, we were married. So... Um, <laughs> so I, I, I set that up because as I became a married man and then had one child and then two children, I realized I had something I, I had to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like the pressure of, of providing for other human beings as a good motivator. Um, so at that time, I was still working in restaurants and I was working at the Red Lobster at that point in uh, 2000, um, 2006. And I was about to go get a job at uh, Pechanga Resort and Casino. But when I was working at Red Lobster one night, I was cleaning up all crab legs underneath the table and I was entertaining people. I'm very, I'm, I'm a great waiter. I'm fantastic. I'm entertaining. It's, it's just a good time. I bet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really, inter it's really fun. And uh, Mike and Robin Zing, which I'm sure, you know, they're, they're icons here in the, the local real estate market. Um, they were sitting at a table and they said, hey, you know, they waved me over and they're like, man, you have a really good personality. Have you ever thought about getting into real estate? And I said, realtors, they, uh, they uh, drop babies and they kick puppies. Why would I do that? Right. Like I just viewed realtors as in a very negative way. And I was yeah. like, all right, you know, I'll take his business card. I'm like, all right, thanks, guy. And then a few weeks later, I was watching one of those late night infomercials and, uh, and is, you know, one of those hour long programs where if you buy my book, you know, you'll be an instant real estate success and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I could do that. And so I called Mike Zing and he got me enrolled in real estate school. And, um, you know, you can take real estate school in about six weeks here in California. And it took me 18 months because, you know, the ADD kicked in and just trying to be a father and provide for my family. But it all came to a head when I had already transferred over to Pachanga Resort and Casino and I was a casino host. And this was in 2008. And I, I the casino, um, as a casino host, your whole job is to reach out to the gamblers and bring them in and, and bring them into these tournaments because you're trying to build the relationship. And ultimately, so they're dropping money at the casino. Right. Right. And um, but nobody knew who I was at these tournaments because there'd be thousands of people. And so as a joke, when we're cold calling, you know, all of us casino hosts, there's about a dozen of us and we're cold calling our list. And I said, I started telling my people on the phone because I was trying to make the other people in the room laugh. I said, well, come find me. I'll be the bald guy in the red tie. And everyone, ha, ha, ha. Well, at the tournament that weekend, you know, as, as casino hosts, we had to go find our guests, which is impossible because you don't know what they look like. And, you know, there's thousands of people, but all of my guests were coming to me. Because right. So I, I, yeah. Because of the red tie and the bald head. Uh -huh. So and being a marketing guy from my whole history and background, I realized, you know, marketing is all about a, a visual differentiation. That's what branding is. So if you can stand in the middle of a crowd and, and like, for example, if you're in a, a crowd of a thousand people and they said, hey, uh, here's the logo. Can you find out where that person is? Most of the time they're like, uh, not really. Right. But hey, who's the ball guy in the red tie? It stands out like a sore thumb kind of thing. Right. Um, so I realized the light bulb went off at that point. And then um, concurrently, I had a friend that uh, got me into the Monavi multi-marketing juice business. Uh, it's like a hundred dollar bottle of grape juice. That was supposed to magically, you know, heal you. And um, so I figured, well, these gamblers are dropping thousands of dollars into slot I machines. Can afford that. Yeah. yeah, you can afford a hundred dollar bottle of juice. So I was on the down low selling Monavi juice to my gamblers. And then, uh, you know, casinos, they have cameras every three feet. They know exactly what you're doing at all times. And so they called me in for the private investigation. And I just immediately knew I was like, oh, I'm done. And uh, so they, they lay out all this information. You know, it looked like an FBI interrogation. And, <laughs> and they're like, do you have anything safe for yourself? I was like, well, I guess I don't work here anymore, huh? And so they, uh, they walked me out with security guards. And I was yeah. like. Oh, my gosh. I could totally see that, too. You know, <laughs> I, it's like, you know. Oh, my gosh. You know, when you Did work. Like, I remember working for companies, you know, back in the day. And 
being so stressed out to make sure that I was following the rules and doing yeah. everything they wanted me to do. And I had no, I had nothing for myself. Like I just only, like I was a slave to them. Right. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of companies that work by, and they manage by intimidation. That is probably the biggest form of intimidation right yeah. there that you could think of. And it's like, listen, I'm a human. I was just selling some juice over here. I'm not selling drugs. <laughs> like, come on. Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and <laughs> it's funny how we rationalize things because I was like, well, if the gamblers are healthy, then they'll be more, they'll spend uh, more they'll, money and they'll come they'll back. Like, but they weren't having it. The, you know, the, the, the casino was like, yeah, no, uh, you're fired. Okay. Um, did you get this magazine in the mail, by the way? I sent it to you the other day. Um, I will check to see. I don't know. I, I don't have it yet, but that's... Uh, all right. Well, Lobsters I'll send it to you. Red ties. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So, uh, let's see if I get that. Um, so you know, my my assistant, she actually worked at Red Lobster as well. Oh yeah. I know so many people that worked at that restaurant, and then of course, you know, our old brokerage is in the same parking lot. And that ironic. Yeah. But, uh, a lot of people started there at that restaurant in this valley. Well, you know, I think um, restaurant work is is incredible. I think it's a great training ground for realtors because as a, I think as a everyone. Reader, and I even tell my, my, my boys only one, you know, wait, he's a bartender now, you know, uh, for, for a brewery. Um, well, it's actually a pizza place, but he also worked for a brewery as well here in Temecula. But I told them when they first got their jobs, I said, you need to wait tables. Like yes. you have to be in the restaurant industry. It teaches you how to speak to people. It teaches you about humans, how we act, um, good and bad sides. But, yep. um, you know, it just really sets you up for life. I think everyone should have to be in the restaurant industry at some point. Customer service, 100%. 100% agree with you because it teaches you about being of service, teamwork, um, coordinating. Because, you know, it's very similar to real estate in the sense that, you know, uh, you got to be nice to the kitchen staff or else your food's not going to be coming out on time kind of thing, right? Right. It's yeah. like, you know, when people are screaming at escrow officers, I'm like, are you doing that? Because you want them on your side. You want uh, them on your side, you know? Yeah, you don't. And, and I think anybody that's ever done a deal with me that they realize that even when problems come up and, and the poo hits the fan, you know, I'm always pretty level headed and, uh, and just try to find the best situation and, and make it a win win situation for all people. You know, I think that's where our industry kind of went wrong. So many ways is that people have this uh, mentality of us versus them and they have to start crap out of a contract just to prove to their clients that they're fighting for them kind of things like we're all trying to get to the same direction. You know, let, let's be kind. Let's figure yeah. out, let's understand both sides of the table and let's try to just make a, um, a, a good solution happen. But it just baffles me when people want to pick fights over the smallest things. Um, but that's my perspective. And that comes from the restaurant business. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I started, um, gosh, I started, you know, uh, Burger King was my first job at 15 and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I was a telemarketer at as well. I had two jobs in high right. school, right? So I was a telemarketer for a mortgage company. That's how I got my start in the industry at 15 and a half on the phone. Wow. Well, and then at, at four, uh, 15, actually, as soon as I could get my work permit, I was door knocking and selling windows, siding and doors. So you had all the ingredients for being oh a successful. Gosh, all of it, right? And I had a newspaper route at 11. Like, so you have that same drive, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I think, you know, well, my story is very similar, but I, I mean, I had to hit the pavement running, you know, yeah. I'm, I was a foster child as well. So there's some history there, but, um, you know, I always had to fend for myself. Nobody else was going to do it for me. Right. So yeah. it's, it's hard for me to actually have empathy for those that, that don't come from that. And I've had to do a lot of work on that, yeah. um, in my adult life to, to have empathy. Empathy has just never been in my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, another story. But um, so moving into your real estate industry uh, or your real estate career, you know, so you got started and I'm going to bring this up. And I actually was trying to find the property the other day. I'm going to have you look it up and tell me what the address was, because this is when you and I first connected. And it was, I think it was 2008, in fact, because I we had just moved to Temecula. Yeah. It, must have, it must have been like one of your very first listings. Yeah. And um, I remember pulling up to the property. It was, you know, out like it was Hemet, but Winchester. 
like back in the day when it was just all like the sea of short sales were coming out. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I think your seller was still trying to sell and they were coming in and the market was folding. Right. Yep. And, you know, back when we were starting to, we just, you know, it was either a short sale. Um, the bank owns weren't even really out yet. They were just coming, just folding out. Like, right. Just, I think Bob Cadez was like the biggest REO agent in our Valley at that time. And he had like all the listings. We even bought our house from Bob Cadez. But, everybody uh, did. What? I said everybody bought a house from Bob Cadez because he yeah. had all the listings. He had all the listings, right? So, mm -hmm. but I remember pulling up outside in my minivan and um, I was meeting a client for the first time at your property and I was brand new to short sales, brand new. And so I, I believe I called you on the phone and you were so nice. And I sure as heck didn't expect this young guy the bald head, you know, the bald guy with the red tie for you to be so young. I thought you were going to be like some old man, like talking down to me. Yes, Miss, Miss Meeker. Well, you know, but you were so yeah. nice. And I'll never forget that conversation. And we were both new and we yeah. were both like, what do I do? You know, kind of thing. And you're like, well, this is what's going on with my seller. And I'm like, okay, great. And we didn't end up, I don't think we ended up writing on that property, but I just remember your kindness. And your generosity and just your friendship that you started even then. And we didn't even know each other. And then I, we circled back around when we were with our past brokerage where we had, you know, it was a blessing to actually work alongside you and to get to know you more. You know, I know we shared a lot of, you know, um, amazing conversations about the market, uh, what we're doing in our businesses. And, you know, you were there for me to vent on a lot. And by hopefully I was there for you as well. but. Um, I've just really respected how you have always stayed true to what your vision is for your business, right? Yeah. So, you know, even though, you know, there was conversations where I'm like, you know, just, just build, just build a team, just go, you can do this. And you're like, nope, I'm going to, I want to be right here because my kids come first and I want to make sure that I'm there for them as a dad. And a lot of that stemmed back to your upbringing and making sure that you were there for your kids. So do you mind to just, you know, elaborate on how important that is? I've just always had so much respect for you on that because this business can suck you in. Yeah. It can suck you in, turn you around, spit, chew you up and spit you out just as fast as you get into it. Right. And you've 100%. just always dug your heels in and you've stayed consistent. Well, um, uh, so thank you for saying all those kind words. You're very generous with all that. And I appreciate that. And, um, but to be completely transparent and vulnerable, uh, with the audience here is that, um, because I was in such a, uh, hyper drive of wanting to be successful, but then also just wanting, needing to provide for my family. Um, you know, I was working when I was a new agent from uh, 2008 to 2015, I was a workaholic. I would work, you know, 12, 18 hour days, no problem. And I, and I really kind of would get frustrated with the, the wife and kids because at that point, like, um, you know, we, at, at that point we had three kids under the age of five. Yeah. And, right um, yeah. And, and that's a very, you know, people always, uh, romanticize that age. Like, Oh, it's so cute. You know, that's all the new things are happening in child development and all that kind of stuff. And it's very important. But I found it very frustrating because um, I don't deal well with, uh, you know, screaming meltdown toddlers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and, I, and I ended up analyzing it because my dad was not there in those first five years of my life. And my stepdad came around when I was about five, six years old. But um, so I just didn't have the mental wiring of what it meant to be a dad on that day to day kind of thing. Like my dad would would come in every few months and be Disneyland dad and we'd have a great time and all that kind of stuff. But um so I found those first couple of years very challenging. And so what I did is I just really dove into real estate and work and all that kind of stuff. Cause that's where I found my validation. Right. So it, similarity there though, you dove in and somewhat self-medicated yourself with the business, with the industry, right? right? Because right. you didn't know really how to, uh, you didn't really know what to do with that information. What you're well, saying, correct. Right? I, I didn't know how to be a good dad. Cause I just didn't have that that blueprint, unfortunately. And, um, whereas I, I knew how to get validation through business and creative ideas and all that kind of stuff. So I, I doubled down on that. And then, so I was kind of on that path of just, you know, 
you know, in this business, it's like, if you do 20 deals, you want to do 40 deals. And then if you do 40 deals, you want to do a hundred deals. And you know, it's, it's always chasing numbers. Yeah. And I had a, an older wise man share with me. He said, if you're always chasing numbers, numbers never end. So where do you draw the line at kind of thing? Right. And you could, you can climb the ladder to the, the top of success on the tallest building. But if you get to the top of the ladder and you look around and nobody's around you, cause you burnt out your family and you know, workaholics are very challenging to live with because you, there's just always that kind of edge that they have. Cause you could tell that they'd rather be doing something else instead of, you know, playing a board game with their kids or whatnot. And so in 2015, um, I was having one of those soul moments where the leaves were falling again. So again, that seasonal wow. pattern of life. Mm-hmm. And so I was, uh, I was coaching with, uh, the wonderful Wendy Whitelaw and, Love uh, her. I love her. She's, okay. she's, Hi, a, Wendy. she's an amazing <laughs> human being. And so um, when I first sat down with her, she said, okay, well, why are we here? You know, what are you hoping to get out of this? I said, well, I want to do a hundred deals next year. I want to recruit a hundred agents. I want to, you know, and it was all these number based things and all this kind of stuff. And Wendy in her gracious, beautiful, wonderful way uh, broke it down for me. She's like, okay, well, if you achieve all of that, you know, you make the million dollars, you do all these kind of things. What does that get you? Like, what is it that you're really wanting from that? I'm like, well, if I had all of that, then I can go ride dirt bikes with my kids in the field and I can do all this kind of stuff. And she's like, well, do you need a million dollars to do that? And it, and it was one of those simple things that just kind of shattered the whole glass house of your understanding. I said, well, I guess not. And she's like, well, how much money do you really need to do all that kind of stuff? And so we kind of broke it down and I came to realize, like, I don't need to be that guy that does 100 transactions a year. Um you know, this industry is very ego driven and it's great to be successful. And I hope everybody achieves whatever that they want to achieve. But I came to realize I'm good with 20, 30 deals a year. I mean, especially here in Southern California, you know, you know, the price points, the commission breaks and all that kind of stuff. That's a good income. Mm-hmm. And and what I realized is I was able to um, balance my life out. And, and instead of working, you know, 12, 18 hours a day, I can now work, say, maybe 10 to 20 hours a week and achieve all of that. And then the rest of the time is spent with family and making those memories, which is ultimately um, when we come to our final moments, you know, that's what you're really going to be working. You're thinking through, you're not going to be at the end of it on your deathbed and go, Oh man, I wish I put more lock boxes up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's, so that's where I invested. <laughs> so um, thanks, Wendy, Wendy Whitelaw for that. She is simply amazing. And that uh, Wendy, I will be reaching out to you soon too, by the way, girl, but um <laughs> Yeah, you know, I feel like there's just, you know, we only have so much time, you know, on this earth. And, you know, you know, we, we picked an industry that will suck you in, you know, and, you know, I've said this to agents in the past, like, if you don't know, or try to figure out what you want out of this business, right, be careful. Right. And, you know, people on the outside of our world, they have no idea. They have right. really no idea what it's like to run a, a real estate business, number one, to get started, yep. the investment that it takes, two, to stick with it, yep. you know, because the, 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 the duration to get from zero to one could be 12 months, right? And you're in the hole, right? Um, but most importantly is to align yourself and get yourself into rooms where you can lean on people. And I know when we both started, you know, I, I've been in the industry as a whole since I was 15. I have been blessed to be around some of the most smartest people in the real estate and mortgage sector than I've ever been in my entire life. And I still contribute to uh, being a salesperson. Um because I am a salesperson, you're a salesperson. I own that. I love that. I'm, I have a ton of pride for that. I know it's gotten a bad rep, you know, in the years. And I remember when I was younger to be a salesperson was like, you know, the grime and dirty, but I'm so grateful to be a salesperson. You know why? Because I get to help people. I get to find their pain points and help them through those pain points. I get to help them win. Right. And we weren't, I wasn't raised like that, but the, one of the best salespeople of my entire life was my brother. Mm. And that guy could do circles in any type of industry around anyone. You know why? Because he had a heart yep. and he cared. Right. And so being in real estate, people don't realize like we're humans 
And, but most of my friends that are successful and those that aren't my friends that I look at, they started in here because they either, they came across something that was really a transition in their life. They, 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 um, usually came in on their heels, like with nothing. Right. And they've built themselves to some place based on caring about others and giving back. Well, right. and that, that is the beauty of this business. Um, and what's funny is I actually interviewed uh, Wes Schaefer, who's known as the sales whisperer. And because um, I too kind of struggled with uh, the term salesmanship, because unfortunately, it's just gotten such a bad rap. It the really has, but it's actually. Sale. And then he said something that was so enlightening because Wes Schaefer, if you don't know him, he's a fascinating, brilliant man. But he said uh, sales, uh, the word sales um it's, it, I don't know. I forgot what country it was, but the root word of that means service. Oh, okay. I so I, I forgot yeah. what the nationality of it was, um, but he said it, it's basically to be a servant. And what's funny about that is that my last name Butler means servant. Yeah. So really, I'm just kind of destined. You know, destined to serve. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, with your real estate business, though, and being, and we've we've gone over a little bit here. I hope that's okay. You doing okay on time? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm here. Perfect. Okay. I'm Perfect. So I want to talk about too, you know, and that's why I led into that being um, a father, mm -hmm. being the sole provider of your family. Right. right. Um, and I've met Jen. She's absolutely beautiful. Like you are yes. so lucky to have such a beautiful lady, but not only that, she's right there by your side, but the pressure of being the sole provider in a family, raising children, has its own issues, right? Its oh, yeah. own level of pressure. And so with that, you had to be really uh, purposeful with your time to be able to yeah. get in, work 20 hours a week, you know, because this is not a 20 hour a week career. It's really 24 seven, but you were purposeful for 20 hours of that time through that week, right? So right. what did you do in your business that another agent could take away from um, your, uh, your disciplines that you did in order to maybe try to have that 20 hour a week, you know, and it could be new, doesn't matter, new agent or an agent that's been in the business forever, you know, a veteran doesn't matter, but they're struggling with, I really want to spend more time with my family. Um, and, or I want to take more vacations, more time for myself. So what would I need to do in order to, what would that look like? What would I need to do? Um, so when you understand the process of real estate, uh, whether it's on the buyer side or on the listing side, you realize that it is a process. Mm -hmm. And so there's certain phases, there's certain steps, excuse me, there's certain steps that you got to take. And then after you've been doing this long enough, you realize that um, all clients, they, they all have their own uniqueness to their situation and to their lives. But for the most part, I would say 90% of it, um, you always get the same questions. You always get the same, um, uh, Maybe a deal falls apart in a certain way and all mm -hmm. these kind of things. And so years ago, what I did um, being the video king in real estate is um, I started making videos, just one minute videos of the most common questions that people ask or the common problems and, and, and situations and all that kind of stuff. So that way, when, um, you know, your client calls you at 11 o'clock on Friday, which I don't answer those calls anymore, but, um, yeah. you know, th those panic moments that the clients have. Um, I could just, my YouTube channel is really more a, a quiver for all my arrows and the videos are the arrows. And so I can send them that video. So instead of spending 20, 30 minutes or an hour explaining the whole process, I can give them a one minute video and they go, oh, okay. Right. And so that alone took out a lot, a big chunk of my, um, my time needed to invest in the business. And another thing is that, um, you know, majority of realtors, what they spend the majority of their time doing is prospecting, which is fantastic because that's how you generate business. But using the ball guy, red tie attraction based model, what I figured out at Pachanga, right? So instead of chasing the, the gamblers, instead of chasing your clients, I say, well, how do I get them to come to me? And yeah. so um, <clears throat> I used my branding, I used social media, and then I used video. And I started doing video in 2009 and posting it to Facebook. And if you remember that time frame, you know, social media was a toddler, right? Facebook was yeah. just getting its legs. Uh, YouTube was was a new thing. Video marketing was a new thing. 
but I realized, you know, what are my strengths? My strengths is the personality, you know, the humor, the articulation, all these kind of things. And so I started making videos and I would put it out there. And this is before, uh, you know, Facebook became a, a pattern of algorithms and all this kind of stuff. But I was one of the first people to do all that kind of stuff in this, this local area. And so what it did is instead of me having to go do open houses or cold call or door knock or farm a geographical area or whatnot, I can have fun do what I do best, put the video out there. And then videos, I would try to make evergreen. So I wouldn't say, Hey, here's the July, 2009 update. I would, I would make it more of, Hey, I'm doing this fun thing over here. If you want to do a fun thing then come find me and, and we'll go do it together. And so it, it turned the tables where that's where business just comes to me kind of thing. And so I, I save, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week on not having to prospect. So. Whereas if I did prospect, I'd probably be a lot more successful, but that was my form of, of generating business and it seemed to work. Sure. And you're still doing that today, right? So Very the necessary. videos are the both live on forever. Right. And, and that's why I, I do those videos in an evergreen way. Um, so that way they can be like, there's people that will call me off the uh, bald guy goes to boot camp video that I did 12 years ago, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so it's, uh, it's entertaining. Uh, which it, it aligns with my core value system. I love to entertain people. And, uh, you know, I also like being on video, you know, turn the camera on, I'm ready to go. And then people seem to like it. So you've leveraged video. And right. I mean, I just heard probably two positions that as an agent, because that's, I think that the other um, information that, either people that are getting into the industry or, and I, and I talk to agents about this a lot, you know, they're a year in up to five years in and they refuse to leverage video. They mm. refuse to leverage like a, a virtual assistant or even have an assistant in order to have a better life. Right. Mm. In order to, you know, because if you're doing 25 transactions, you and I both know if you don't leverage something, it's going to kill you. Right. Because we are the assistant, we are the buyer agent, we are the listing agent, we're the listing concierge, we are the vessel to escrow, to title, to the HOA, to everything, right? And right. so you cannot physically run a successful business and and do it well with that type of process, right? Or that model. And I'll I'll coach with clients or I'll, you know just in or agents and just talking with them and mentoring them and saying the first thing you have to do is lay it out. What do you want from this industry? Where what are your goals? Where are you where are you headed in the next one year, two years, three years, five years? Right? Because if you want to be here, this is what you have to implement in your business, right? And so you leveraged YouTube, you leveraged Facebook, you you all by video and doing educational videos so that even though you had to, you know, maybe you had to put the video out there to your client, which is fine. Right. What does that take you? Maybe five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day to do that. Right. But that video leveraging video is what you did in order to gain yourself that extra 10 hours a week. Right. In theory. Absolutely. And, and so the video does a lot of the heavy lifting. And then also, you know, I'm a, I'm a great chess player. Uh, meaning I can anticipate the moves and behaviors of other people uh, before they happen or before I'm always uh, 10 steps ahead kind of thing. And so yeah. understanding the process and understanding the questions that your clients might have, if you can proactively nip it before they even know what it is like, Oh, Hey, by the way, when we get into this part of the process, you're going to experience this. So here's a video about that. So you already know what it is. And then it never becomes an issue for them. Cause they're like, mm -hmm. you've already, you've already told them what's going to happen. So properly setting expectations is huge. Um, and then, so if you can use that with, with the videos, then um, that just makes your life better. But ultimately the most important thing is that it makes your clients experience better because where clients get stressed and they feel anxious is when they don't know what's about to happen. Right. And it's a human natural psychological uh, response is that if they don't know what's about to happen then the anxiety increases and when anxiety increases, the fear increases and when the fear increases, the anger increases. And so that's why when you get those big blow ups with, with clients, sometimes it's because they, their expectations weren't set properly. And so if you can understand the psychology of what that person is going through and then preemptively and proactively, um, address those issues before they even know that's an issue. That's where they get that magical experience 
And that's where, you know, they get to the end of it and like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. I thought it was going to be way worse and all that kind of stuff. And they don't even realize all the strings that you're pulling in the background. They just think it looks easy. So um, that's what I always aim for. Right, right. Well, and, you know, if you're, if so if you're an agent that doesn't have the videos, like what you have put together, mm -hmm. the educational videos, mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel that, you know, checklists would be in order, right? Yeah. So a checklist where you're firing off, you know, emails to update. But, you know, um, I know for us, we have a buyer and a seller guide that we give to our clients where it's more, you know, hands-on touching, you know, versus maybe the videos. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely going to write that down. It's been on my checklist to do for quite some time um, to put together educational videos. So I think it's really important that the, the client does know the next process, especially with us being in a market right now that's more normalizing and not moving so fast. I think we could get away with it the last, you know, couple of, you know, I, and I'm going to say four years, because even though we were through the pandemic and it was just race, 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 you know, right. But two to three years, even before the pandemic, we were pretty lucky. I, I want to say lucky. I know we weren't lucky because we do, we put in the work, right. But a lot of agents got lucky, you know, right, right wrong or, or ugly or whatever it may be. But, you know, at the end of the day, having checklists, having a process to follow, having systems in place to be able to execute for the better experience of the consumer or your client is definitely key. Huge. I mean, because ultimately um, the focal point of a real estate transaction is the client. Mm -hmm. It's all about taking care of the client because that's the service and the fiduciary duty that we have towards our clients. And so whatever we can do to make that experience better, that's, that's I think, the ultimate calling of, of our service. And, um, and so if you are of service and to that degree and to provide that type of experience, um, I think you'll do very well. So, so are you, um, <clears throat> are you currently reading like any books or anything that you would like to share that, that you've read in the past, you know, maybe six months or so that you'd like to share with, um, any agents that would help them with their business? Or um, I am, uh, first one being the stare by John Butler. So make sure you get that copy. Amazing on Amazon. Book. <laughs> Great book. Um, and then uh, I'm going through Brene Brown's um, Dare to Lead. Okay. And so um, here at the office on Tuesdays at four o'clock, we have a, a book club, uh, myself, Susan Ebert, and a gentleman named Bobski. And so we uh, will read a, a chapter every Tuesday. And um, so it's just kind of fun to get together and, and talk ideas and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's what we do there. And then as far as... Um, books I, I think right now the season that i'm in right now uh you know talking about the leaves falling and new things blossoming so you know i, I spent the past um 14 years doing the videos and i i, I kind of got to a point where i felt like i did as much as i wanted to do with all that and then so my new thing that i'm doing is is writing my own magazine uh called the red tie community which kim you, you gotta i'm gonna go check today it, it's in the mail okay and so um you know, my, what, is, what is the red tide community? Are you getting ready to go into that? Well, yeah. Bring that up. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the podcast show was called red tide community. Um, but if you actually go back into some of my earlier videos, I think in 2009, uh, was the first time I uttered, uh, greetings, red tide community, you know, it's the ball guy in the red tide. And so that was always my intro into all of my videos and stuff like that. Unbeknownst to me that what I was really doing as I was laying the foundation, because for me, it's all about the sphere of influence and the relationship relationships that you have. Mm -hmm. And so community means bringing multiple people together and having a unified vision for something. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I always just wanted to have my community, right? It's kind of like Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor kind of thing. And um, but my true purpose on this planet you know, real estate's my occupation, but my purpose is writing and to inspire and encourage other people. Um, and so what you're going to be seeing from these magazines, uh, the Red Tide Community Magazine, is me telling a lot of those stories over the past 14 to 25 years that I've collected um, in short format. It's about 2000 words, every article and story. Um, and the ultimate purpose is to inspire and encourage other people to find their purpose. Um, and yeah, it'll talk about real estate a little bit, but it, it's not like, hey, I'm a realtor, I'm a realtor, I'm a realtor. It's more of here was the challenge of how we navigated this situation. And oh, by the way, I sell real estate. Um, so that's kind of my approach. 
So I'm pretty excited about that. And what's really cool is my 17 year old son is the one that did all the graphic layout uh, in the in the magazine. Wow. So I'm teaching him about uh, marketing and branding and all that kind of stuff. And it's just awesome to be side by side with him and uh, and then see. And he gets to see that creation process and he gets to see the fruits of those labors and how that ripple effect happens. Um, so it's really cool to kind of uh, help build the next generation of, of uh, marketing DNA. So. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It sounds amazing. Well, John, first and foremost, I want to thank you so much for jumping on here today. So if we wanted to find your podcast, where could we find that? Um, if you go to youtube.com slash bald guy red tie, um, you'll, you'll find a lot of them there. Um, I have over a thousand videos on YouTube, so uh, it's a little bit challenging to navigate through. But um, ultimately, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, if you want to reach out to me, you know, facebook.com, instagram.com slash bald guy red tie. And you're like, hey, John, send me a video. I'll be more than happy to send you a uh, whatever you might want. And I have videos from Sheriff Chad Bianco to Santa Claus um, on, on the podcast show. So I've interviewed just about every walk of life. And, and I'll leave you off with this, Kim, as you venture into the podcast space, is that this video is, is about an hour long right now, right? Yeah. And so you got that one solid loaf of bread for the video. What right. I would encourage you to do is, is watch the video and send it to your video editing guy and then chop out the nice little sections, the little 45 second blurbs, the one minute blurbs, three minute blurbs, you know, whatever was a good section out of this, um, because then you could turn that one video into 10, 15, 20 different videos. Right. You get the, the biggest bang for your buck if you can break that into slices and then you could spread those breadcrumbs out in the water, um, all with, you know, the same marketing material that you have. So, um, so that for you and for whoever else might want to do that. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, we'll talk to you later. Okay. All right. See you in escrow. Bye. Bye. Well, hopefully very soon, right? We need to do a deal together. It's been way too long. It's always fun working with you. All right. Hang on there for real, just for a quick minute, if you will. And sure. then I'll go ahead and end this. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.